copper is an all-time high, but are there options to invest in the red metal without the risk of the mining investments? We interview Amerigo Resources, a copper leverage company with predictable results and a focus on shareholder returns. If you are interested in investing in the world's greenest copper producer, you can miss this program. Welcome, mining lovers. This is Cerlano de Minas, the Spanish podcast dedicated to mining investment. Now, in English. Do you want to learn? Subscribe. Do you want more content in English? Leave us a comment. The episode is about to start. Bear in mind that this interview has been translated with the help of artificial intelligence from Spanish. You can find minor defects to the translation method. Welcome to a new episode of Charlando de Minas, the only Spanish podcast dedicated to mining and commodity investment. Today, in English. Uh, today, we have the privilege to have Aurora Davidson, former president, CEO, and director of Ameringo Resources, which is a unique company in the mining sector with an innovative and sustainable approach to copper and molybdenum extraction. If you are listening to this and you were expecting to have this episode in Spanish, don't worry, check around the channel and you will find the original interview with Aurora in the language of Cervantes. If you are a newcomer and you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do it so and uh, we keep it uh, with different content about mining and commodity investment. Amerigo Resources operates through its Chilean subsidiary, Minera Valle Central, under a long-term agreement with El Tiniente Division, the world's largest underground copper mine operated by Codelco, Chile's state-owned mining company. This agreement allows them to treat both new and historical tellings in order to extract copper and molybdenum, subsequently selling them at market price. Uh, what sets Amerigo apart is not only the ability to generate value from mining waste, but also its resilient business model, which uh, mitigates the traditional risk associated with mining. In addition, the company is known for its commitment to the shareholder return, implementing a consistent dividend policy and a share uh, buybacks. In today's episode, we will explore how Ameringo Resources has managed to maintain a successful sustainable operation, the challenge and opportunities facing the current copper markets, and its vision for the future of both mining and sustainability as a company. Ameringo Resources is listed in the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticket symbol IRG.TO. Hi Aurora, how are you? Welcome to the program. Hello, Amadeo. Thank you for inviting us to this important means of dissemination, Charlando de Minas. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start with the interview. First of all, I would like to do like a, a bit of overview of the company, right? So could you explain us the business model of Ameringo Resources and how it relates to El Tiniente Division and Codelco? Of course. Look, our business model is very simple. It consists of generating additional economic value from recovering copper exclusively from tailings. And tailings are essentially waste from the mining process. In our case, these tailings come from the current production of the largest underground copper mine in the world, El Teniente Mine, which, as you said, is owned by Codelco, the Chilean National Copper Corporation. These tailings that come from current production are known as fresh tailings, but we also process old tailings, or what we know as historic tailings that were deposited by El Teniente in past decades. As economic compensation for giving us the right to process these tailings, we pay a royalty to El Teniente. And the copper we recover, which is copper concentrate, we sell at market prices. That is the broad outline of the business model. 
very simple. To recover copper from tailings, to economically compensate the owner of the tailings for allowing us to work with these tailings, and to produce a copper concentrate that is sold to the market. Our processing plant, uh, Minera Valley Central, which is in Chile, is essentially a bypass between the El Teniente mine and the tailings deposit, where El Teniente deposits the tailings in perpetuity. The tailings enter our plant so that we can recover this additional copper and then they leave our plant to continue their transfer to the El Teniente tailings deposit. Our objectives are to produce copper but also to produce financial margin and always to carry out these economic functions with full respect for the environment and always, always, always ensuring the safety of our workers. Worker safety at Amerigo or at MVC is something that you will always know that we publish and that we talk about. And this is broadly our business model, Amadeo. Perfect. Since this is an occasional program also, and we all want to learn, and this was one of the main reasons for putting out this podcast, I would like if you could explain to us exactly how the process of extracting copper from the tailing works, right? Um, what is different, for example, from what Codelco is doing? Uh, what is the difference between the fresh and the old tailings? Also, if you can explain maybe what are the different species of copper that are involved and if there is any technical implication with the different ones. Yes, of course it is. Look, at Minera Valley Central, we would see it as MVC. At MVC, what we have is a concentrator plant it's a traditional concentrator plant that you would find in any copper mine. Our plant is a plant with a processing capacity of 185,000 tons per day. And it is essentially a plant with milling and flotation circuits to recover, as I was saying before, copper concentrates and also molybdenum as a byproduct. We have two separate circuits to produce the concentrates from fresh tailings or historic tailings because the mineralogical characteristics of both tailings are different. The fresh tailings, as I mentioned before, are tailings that come from the Teniente concentrator. The Teniente has already concentrated that material. It has a tailing as a receipt of its process, and that is what we receive. So it is a material by definition with low grade. And the historical tailings are deposited in a dam called Coquens, which is a dam adjacent to MVC. Those tailings are dry, so we hydraulically recover those historic tailings to be able to bring them into our concentrator plant. What do we have in the plant? It is a typical concentrator. There is no differential process compared to what, for example, the Teniente concentrator might have. We have a primary classification or delamination stage, and there we separate the fine and coarse fractions. The fines are subjected to sweep flotation with what it is known as a scavenger in a cascade system, and the thick fraction goes to a grinding circuit before going to the flotation stage. Before proceeding to the conventional froth flotation stage, the ground coarse fraction passes to a conventional flotation and cleaning circuit, and from there, a combined copper and molybdenum bulk concentrate is produced. This first concentrate is regrinded, passed to a second stage of grinding and cleaning to improve copper and molybdenum grades, and then goes to selective flotation to recover the molybdenum. Tailings from the moly circuit become the final copper concentrate, and once this process is completed, the molybdenum is recovered. And once this process concludes, the final tailings in MVC, both from the fresh and the historical tailings, are thickened before they are passed on to be recycled as copper concentrate, before they are discharged to the tailings channel, which is the Teniente's own tailings channel, which leads these tailings to the Karen Reservoir. The water that is left over, the excess overflow water from these thickeners, is recirculated in the plant, in the MVC plant, as process water. So it's a very traditional, there is no proprietary technology, there is nothing different, it is simply a metallurgical discipline of working with low-grade material. 
What do we work with in MVC? To answer the second part of your question, fundamentally with sulfides. In the fresh tailings, most of the copper is calcopyrite, and we have secondary forms of sulfides such as calcocyte. We have bornite and cobalite. And of the historic tailings, most of it, 75% or so of the copper is in secondary copper minerals, and 17% of it is in the form of chalcopyrite. And in both fresh and historic in molybdenum, it occurs as molybdenite. Very, very interesting. And I have now two questions that come to me right now. Uh, the, the concentration, you told me that they were low. What kind of concentration do you have in the fresh and historical? Do you know approximately? Yes, look, we report that information always in our press releases. Amadeo, I am going to give you exactly right now, if you give me a minute, the last ones reported. We just reported the first quarter of the year. And we have all this information here. Let me give you all the data directly. Because it varies, obviously, from quarter to quarter. We essentially work with the production plan of the El Teniente in terms of the material that we receive from the freshers. And in the Cocanes extraction plan, we develop our own annual production plan. And we have that information. Look, in the Q1, the quarter that just ended March 31st, the grade that we had in the fresh tailings is 0.177%. And the grade of the cocaines of the historical tailings is 0.251%. Exactly, we do not work with any leaching. We are only essentially classification, grinding, flotation, and filtering to dry. All right, I think it's super clear uh, how it works. So now let's talk a little bit about the pricing and royalties. First, I am going to ask you how the air structure for the royalties that you pay to Codelco and how they buy with the copper prices. Look, we pay three types of royalties to the El Teniente. The royalty on the copper we produce from the fresh tailings. Uh, the royalty on the copper from the historic tailings and also a royalty for the miller's production. In all three cases, we have a payment formula which is established in our contract. And this payment formula is associated with the level of production and a percentage factor, which is linked, which is associated with the market price of copper or molybdenum. The higher the price, the higher the factor, and the lower the price, obviously, we also pay a lower factor. This is a scale, depending on how you look at it, ascending, descending with a slope, which is very important for us because in difficult financial times associated with low prices, the royalty drops considerably, keeping the business operating at a break-even point or at a minor loss. And the logical thing is that also with high prices, the compensation increases. What can be done can be done, can't it? Look, I will give you an example. At a price of $3 a pound of copper, the royalty is approximately 72 cents. And at a price of $4.60, which was what we had yesterday, the royalty goes up to $1.48 a pound. All this information seems complex. It seems difficult to capture. On our website, we have a presentation practically making this as accessible to the investor as possible, where you can see, for example, at different copper prices, what would be the different royalties to be paid in a given year. These royalty formulas to the El Teniente are a fundamental part of the success of the relationship between MVC and the El Teniente for more than 30 years because they establish a transparent sharing and a fair distribution of the economic profit of the business over time between both parties. Perfect. No, it's really clear. And I would recommend everyone who is struggling to understand this ratio to, to look it because uh, it, it, may, it helps a lot. It helps a lot. Um, and 
uh, my understanding, uh, and you said, if I'm not mistaken, that you have uh, a ratio, right? You have a range. And this range is defined uh, between just below uh, $2 and $4.8 per pound of copper. And again, if I'm not mistaken, copper have reached a new nominal highs, uh, and we are just above $5 per pound, then we are already out of this range. Um, how it will change uh, this uh, ratio, royalty, if the copper prices keep higher uh, than it's established in the range? Interesting the timing of your question, isn't it? Once the $5 barrier was broken for the first time, you couldn't have come up with a better day to ask me the question. See, that's the range of the copper royalty produced from fresh tailings. The historical tailings royalty formula range ends at 550. So we still have 50 cents more before we get to that answer, but it works anyway, I'll tell you. Our contract indicates that if the market price is outside the range for two consecutive months, or if we are above 480 or 550 for both types of tailings, and the projections indicate its permanence in time. That is, it is not only two months have passed, they are two consecutive months, but we are indicating that we are going to continue with this price level, so we must meet with the El Teniente to review the extension of the scale, maintaining the balance between the parties. Look, in 32 years of contractual relationship, we have only been out of range once in 32 years. When the price of molybdenum did not go down several years ago, and on that occasion the adjustment was made quickly, we know what the formula is, we know what the scale is, and it simply continues with the Perfect. same slope. Now I have a question uh, that came out after talking about the concentration of the different tailings and uh, the, the copper price. No? Do you guys end up deciding which tailing you work with depending a little bit on the copper price? Do you understand me? That a higher price may be worth it to produce in the less concentrated tellings, and when the price is more depressed, maybe do you need to sell more and therefore you're losing a high concentration telling? Or uh, the copper price does not decide which telling are you working on? Four years ago, when I began to serve as CEO of Amerigo, we made the decision to always favor the processing of fresh tailings. Why? Because if you don't process it, you are incurring an opportunity cost where that tailings passed and you didn't recover anything. Historic tailings are finite. Historic tailings are available under our contract for us to process. But to give you an absurd example, if we decided to privilege exclusively the treatment of historic tailings, then you would get them out quickly, and then what would you be left with? So the resource that we always privilege according to the El Teniente mining plan is to process fresh tailings and continue to introduce as a second layer the processing of historic tailings to have the full capacity of the plant to reach our production goals but privileging irrespective of the copper price the processing of fresh tailings. That's perfect, super clear. The agreement with Codelco runs uh, until 2037, right? And how these agreements are managed and reviewed? Uh, I know that we are talking uh, long, uh, in a long term, because it's over 10 years still for this renewing. But what is your long-term vision regarding this contract? Do you think that will be extended? What are your vision? Let me give you a historical reference, because it is always good to do it this way, because we have been through this. The current agreement that we have with Codelco dates back to April 2014, and our previous contract, which is the contract that was enforced between Minera Valley Central and El Teniente when Amerigo acquired Minera Valley Central in 2003, had an expiration date in the year 2021. What happened? Then years before reaching 2021, we began to talk with El Teniente. We began to express our interest in extending the contract and that was done so you do not arrive and knock on the door the day before uh, obviously Codelco is a large company it is a state-owned company 
and the management and agreement of a long-term contract obviously takes time. So you have to take all time precautions to be able to have a constructive dialogue and a productive dialogue with the counterpart. Now I'm going to ask you the main operating costs that uh, Amingo has and how they influence your overall cost structure. Uh, what is your cash cost and what is the all-include sustaining cost? I also tell you that you are the man of key dates. Last week we reported financial results, so I have the fresh data here. In the first quarter of 2024, our normalized cash cost was $1.89 a pound and our all-in sustaining cost normalized was $1.89 a pound. And our normalized all-in sustaining cost was $3.50 a pound and our normalized all-in sustaining cost was $3.50 a pound. The renewal of the collective bargaining agreement. So it affects the normal cost of the operation. I am giving you the 189 of cash costs and 350 of the all inclusive. Let me tell you a little bit about our cost structure. What are our main costs? In this order, they are energy, labor, lime, and the steel that is used in the grinding media. Now, if we go to the cash cost computation, which as you know is a non accounting measure in the mining industry and it is a mix between the state cost elements and the byproduct of the milling enters as a credit, then it is a different formula, but everyone understands what cash cost is when you are looking to invest in the mining industry. What do we have? We have treatment and refining charges are included in there. And in this case, in order of importance, we have energy as number one. Treatment and refining is number two, labor, lime, and grinding media. Now, a molybdenum sales are included in the cash cost as a credit, right? So they can be very significant. For example, in the last quarter, we had molybdenum credits of 34 cents per pound. If we add to the cash cost the royalties to the El Teniente and the depreciation, we arrive at a total cost. And if we add to the total cost, the sustaining capex or sustaining fixed asset investment and the head office administrative costs, that's where we get to 350 a pound. To finish the discussion of costs is that we go into each year knowing to a large extent what our cash cost is going to be. Why? Because in energy costs, we have a long-term contract. We have a fixed rate that is subject only to inflationary annual adjustments. And we are also subject to transfer charges from Chile's central grid to large consumers, but the bulk of the energy cost is well defined. Each year, we negotiate in advance, at least in annual supply, the supply of steel and lime. And well, the treatment charges are based on the annual benchmark that applies to all copper producers. So our cash cost variability where is it going to come from? It's going to be dictated, obviously, by our management of other direct costs. And we do a very good job there. Our people in Chile do an excellent job managing and controlling costs. It will be dictated by the strength or weakness of the Chilean peso against the US dollar and by the price of molybdenum. Every year in our first press release, we report our guidance to the market, indicating this is the cash cost we are targeting and the sensitivities for currency change, for molybdenum price change. It would be such and such, and everything is practically outlined so that everyone can build their own model based on the inputs that you want to use. Perfect. I think that there are a lot of inversions that like Ameringo resources because the leverage that they have in the metal, but also of the limited risk versus the mining operations. Do you think that this kind of investor is the one that invests in Ameringo? Look, in general terms, the investors that we have in Amerigo are looking precisely to have the leverage that you mentioned of the copper price. That is the what calls them is the main interest. In the Amerigos, our annual production, which is approximately 30,000 tons of fine copper per year, puts us in the equivalent of a medium-sized mine. 
And given that our activity starts and ends with the concentrate, then uh, forget about it. We don't have many of the typical risks of the industry. We are practically working in one stage in what would be the more industrial stage of copper recovery. Uh, in fact, many times in my presentations, I present Amerigo as the copper factory. It is not a copper mine, it is a copper factory. Amerigo acquired MVC 20 years ago and has invested hundreds of millions of dollars to reach the current production levels. So we invested in sustaining CAPEX, but we no longer have to invest in growth CAPEX. We are already at the target processing capacity we had when the company was purchased. We are at 185,000 tons per day of processing. This situation has allowed us for the last two years to return capital to investors. And so the profile of our investors has also evolved to include, to include yield investors who are looking for a dividend and who are looking for cash flow security. We'll go into detail later because I think it's a very important part of the company, isn't it? Uh, the investment in terms of dividends and shareholder return. Uh, there is another type of investor that I think that could be really interesting with Amerigo Resources, and it's the one that makes investment thinking about sustainability, right? I think that the copper that you end up generating uh, should be green copper. That's right. The sustainability profile of the company has also attracted investors who require green attributes in the companies they invest in. And if you ask me, is the copper you produce at Mineral Valley Central a green copper? I will not be discreet in my answer. I believe it is the greenest copper on the planet. You are almost giving me the headline of the interview, Aurora. Yes, it is the greenest of all. Why? The copper we receive comes on the one hand exclusively from the El Teniente mine. And El Teniente has had a certification called the Copper Mark since 2021 to 2023 which is the leading sustainability standard for primary copper producers. So the copper that is sent to us and that we receive as fresh tailings already carries the copper mark seal. But what happens independently of that? And that was the free publicity to the El Teniente for having achieved this mark. Now we produce copper exclusively from tailings, exclusively from tailings which are waste materials from a primary product. In other words, our operation is 100% a secondary mining operation, or if you want to call it that circular economy. There is no other company in the world that is producing copper exclusively from tailings. We are the only one. Now, what environmental footprint are we leaving in the production of this copper? Almost none. Our energy consumption profile is 95% electric power and only 5% a combination of diesel and gasoline. And of the 95% electrical energy, what we use at MVC is 100% renewable since 2020 with Palmer certification. Water. Water is an issue that matters a lot in the mining industry. As water consumption, 74% of MVC is recycled water. We require only 0.157 cubic meters of water to process one ton of copper in the plant. And in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, our most recent quantification is 7,000 tons per year. In other words, we have an intensity of 0, 0 per ton of tailings processed and 0 0.25 per unit of metal produced. Practically, if you want to make the calculation, we get an error because it is 0 0.000000. Perfect. As you said, uh, it's one of the greenest coppers in the world. Uh, let's talk now a little bit about the challenges that you guys had in 2023. Amengo operations were significantly affected by the heavy rains and flooding, which resulted with a 31% reduction in copper production, mostly in second and third quarter. Could you comment on the operational challenge that you had due to those heavy rains and the flooding, or if it was more about Codelco having uh, these challenges, and how you overcome those? Look, first let me make a clarification. In fact, the drop in production that you mentioned was a drop in quarters two and three. But on an annual basis, our drop in production as a result of the rains of the 2023rd was 
The annual impact was 10%, and yet 2023 was a year of positive earnings and operating cash flow generation. We continued to reduce our debt. We continued to pay our dividends. But back to the issue of what happened, we were very strongly impacted in 23 by the El Nino weather phenomenon. The rainfall recorded in the area was 780 millimeters. And to give you some context, this is six times more than what we experienced in 2019, which was a year of drought. Well, what is the contrast? In four years, we went from a very strong dry year, a very strong drought challenge, to an unusual dry spell where we had a six times differential. That's very shocking. Uh, what happened specifically? Uh, in June of 2023, the very heavy rainfall and the temperatures Temperatures that prevented snow from forming on the mountain range caused the collapse of three high voltage towers owned by MVC that connect our plant to Chile's central power grid. So when these towers fell, we were completely cut off from the power supply. What happened? Our team on the ground immediately activated emergency power supply to ensure that there was no environmental damage. And within days, we had a temporary power supply that allowed us to start producing copper from the fresh tailings shortly after the collapse of the towers. We did not have sufficient supply to produce historic tailings, which are more intensive in the amount of energy required, but we concentrated on producing the fresh tailings and repairs began immediately. We ended up building seven high voltage towers in three weeks and by mid-July, we were practically in normal production of fresh tailings and historic tailings. The rains continued. It was a period of continuous rains. And they came back strongly a few weeks later. And we had accumulated 2.2 million cubic meters of water in the dam at Cokens, the historic dam. This forced us to completely stop processing at Cokens because all the pumping equipment that we need, which is installed in the dam, to the tailings to the concentrator had to be used for water extraction, and this process took us three weeks. However, we were able to continue during all that time maintaining the production of fresh tailings, and on September 20, we raised the white flag, and we were in normal operations, and the fourth quarter, the 20th and 23rd, was a completely normal quarter for MVC. Well, Aurora, thank you. Very well explained. I think that you were, you were able to to explain to us the difference and having the big picture because sometimes it's very difficult to put in context and and we haven't uh, done really really well now i'm going to ask you uh, if in terms of investment for the next years what do you have planned um, develop it or you are just going to use maintenance what do you have for the next years Look, we want to maintain production levels and our operational continuity at 100%. We are basically focused on keeping the plant in the best possible condition. So a lot of the investment we make is maintenance investment, sustaining investment, what is called sustaining capex. But we also work a lot in the area of risk mitigation. This is an additional layer of forward thinking that has worked very well for us. For example, on the subject of rainfall, a few years ago, our team at MVC predicted that there could be a millennial rainfall, a heavy rainfall, and that if it happened, it could affect operations heavily. What happened? We installed very timely flotation equipment around the pipelines connecting coke ends to the concentrator plant. And then we practically wrapped kilometers of piping in flotation rings. And by these measures, the 23rd flood could have shut down Kokenis production for a much longer period of time. Only this year, last week, we installed a standby transformer exclusively in emergent quality. Why? Because we visualized that there could be a risk that one of our two transformers could fail and in that case affect the operational continuity. So we want to be prepared and have a perfect brand new shiny equipment ready to go into operation in case it is required. Maybe it will never be used, but if it is required, it is there and it is ready. So that is basically the level of investment we are working on. Now, when you talk about investment, everybody says, well, what are your growth plans? How are you going to invest? 
Um, but look, we uh, that was the vision with which Amerigo was bought. Amerigo was producing a fraction of what it produces today. When MVC was producing a fraction of what it produces today when it was purchased 20 years ago, and we have made strong, important investments to reach the production level we are at today. So we are in what for many companies is a continuous aspiration. We have been achieving it and we are already at that point. It is a fallacy to think that a company must always be in growth mode. Nowadays in this industry, with all the regulations that exist, with all the care we must take of the environment and so on, to be able to maintain current capacity levels is already a strong challenge. And we have been doing quite well at Minera Valley Central. Perfect. So if you are not going to grow, what do you do is that you take care of the shareholders, right? So could you explain a little bit how Amerigo uh, manages the shareholder return? Of course. The fundamental premise is the one you mentioned, Amadeo. There is no growth plan at this moment because we are already where we should have been. So what is going on? We have a shareholder return strategy. And the basic premise is that by generating production and by generating financial margin, we are left with two main avenues to address the orderly repayment of debt, which we incurred 100 million US dollars in debt precisely to finance our expansion at current production levels. This debt will be practically at a level of 11 million at the end of this year and fully paid probably by the end of 2025 or no later than 26, which is when this payment order will be completed. And we have CapEx investment levels of sustaining CapEx to measures. We are not requiring tens of millions of dollars a year in additional investment. So the shareholder return strategy becomes very important. And what we wanted was to have a framework, a mechanism in which you no longer had to be thinking about what to do quarter by quarter, but that you already knew exactly what to do and nothing else. You already have the plan. And uh, you just execute according to the level of cash that you have. We have three components in our, in our arsenal of shareholder return. The first one is the quarterly dividend. We have share buybacks and we have additional dividends. Let me walk you through how those work. The quarterly dividend is our fundamental commitment to the shareholder. And the view is that this dividend should be a safe dividend and a regular dividend. Irrespective of the fact that the copper market is cyclical and the price of copper can rise or fall sharply from one period to the next. To this end, Amerigo's board of directors has set this quarterly dividend at three Canadian cents per share. Even with the challenges of El Nino, for example, we were able to pay this dividend without any interruption and are about to pay our 11th consecutive quarterly dividend. In addition to the quarterly dividend, if we have additional cash surpluses that are in response to the copper price, we entered into two distributions of the share repurchase in which we have had strong activity in recent years. We have retired 11% of the existing shares at the beginning of the buyback program. And the extraordinary dividend, which we call it a yield dividend because it is a yield dividend from what? The copper price. The priority is the quarterly dividend. There is no other. And the other two tools depend exclusively on the circumstances of the moment, including the copper spot price, the copper price forecast, and also our share price. Uh, the share buyback and the performance dividend are flexible by nature in everything, in the amount, in the timing, in the periodicity. But the quarterly dividend is not flexible. That should be a safe dividend and regular. A question for me arises when you were talking about the share buybacks. What is the target that you guys have in mind? What is the right price that should be a Meringo? Or in other words, at what price do you don't consider buying shares? Look, it varies. It varies because if you make an analysis of the value of the company, everything is associated with the price of copper. You give me a price of 360 and I come out with a price of my share at X. And if you give me a copper price of 460, 
it varies. So circumstances change, and so there is no magic number. I think the board is very aware of that, and those decisions of are we in the market to buy back or not are ad hoc, and they are purely attending to the real-time information that is emerging at that time. I have not checked this, but have you already given any extraordinary dividend yet? Let's say in periods of high copper pricing. If you have, how big is in reference to the ordinary dividend? We have not given it yet. Obviously, under the current copper price scenario that we are in today, it is very likely that this year the first dividend yield will arise. We have focused on share buybacks. Why? Because Amerigo's share price was very defensible to be in the market buying back our shares. Those circumstances can change and then we would be entering into the first dividend yield. There's no relationship, there's no formula where you say it's going to be double or triple or half of your regular dividend. I think that circumstance, what we have pointed out to the market is that we have complete flexibility with respect to the dividend yield. Perfect. Tell me a little bit about the institutional shareholder. I know that you have some. And how do you interact with them to meet their needs? Look, we have internal shareholders. We have retail shareholders, retail investors, as they are known, or institutional. We have all three. Our face to the market is the same for all types of shareholders. It cannot be different. We have to have the same level of transparency and the same level of diligence towards a shareholder who has a thousand shares of Amerigo versus a shareholder who may have 10% of the company. Now, the due diligence of institutional shareholders, of course, is greater, especially when they are starting their position within Amerigo. And we are completely open to their questions based on public information. So we cannot share information with certain groups or not. All of our information is public. I think our public documents tell very well the business model of Amerigo, the sensitivities to changes in variables, the risks of the business. So basically, our interaction with institutional investors is to answer questions in the same way that we would answer questions to any other shareholder that comes in contact with us. Okay. Are there different companies that are working in new technology, especially for telling treatments or low concentration deposits uh, like Newton, uh, Rio Tinto, Litec? Are you exploring or do you plan to explore in the future any of those technologies to extract even more copper than you are considering right now? Look, we know all those technologies. We know how they have been working in the various pilot tests that are being conducted. They are not cheap. They are technologies that want to share the business with the generator of the technology, but we are aware of them now. In a much more immediate and orderly way, we understand that any investment that we make has to have a return. And what we have done over the last few years has been to continue to identify conventional optimizations within our process. In the last four years, we have conducted very practical, very down-to-earth optimization studies, and they have given us tangible benefits. They are not with cutting-edge technology, but we are not experimenting. We are wanting to work, as we know how to do it, with low-grade tailings, taking care of the costs and investment associated with them, and knowing that we need to keep our operation economically viable at all times. That's part of the DNA of our MVC team. Yeah, well, you don't always have to invent the wheel, right, to do business. Uh, okay, so I only have left three questions for finish. First, I'm going to ask you, you were talking about the team that you had in Chile, so I don't know if you can explain a little bit about their, um, what are the strengths no, that they have there? Well, I'm going to need an hour to talk about the points. No, look, there is an important sentence, let me share it, uh, talking about the team. Uh, the strength of the team is each member, and the strength of each member is the team. We have a small team as far as the leadership team is concerned. At the headquarter level, we are four participants. 
We are fortunate to have the founder of Amerigo, Dr. Klaus Heitler, who has six decades of experience in the mining industry as chairman of the board. Carmen Amesquita is our CFO in charge of corporate finance. Kim Thomas is corporate secretary and there's me as if I've been there for four years. But I have been working at Amerigo for 20 years previously in finance as CFO. Now in Chile, in Chile we have four managers at MVC led by Christian Cáceres, uh, our general manager. Christian is a very solid metallurgical engineer with decades of experience in MVC. And the rest of the operational structure we have organized in the areas based on the functional areas. We have the production management led by Julio Leiva, the business continuity management with Benjamin Campos in charge, and the administration and finance management under Javier Tapia. Each member of Amerigo's MVC team has a very strong technical score, has a very strong technical background. We have no beginners on this team, but what sets the team apart, in my opinion, is the clarity with which we work. We are focused on achieving performance targets that we clearly set each year to ensure that as a company we continue to move forward, to ensure that as a company we keep moving forward. The main strength is staying focused on what we have to do every day and doing it day in and day out and getting it done. Uh, the discipline of coming to work every day and doing what you have to do, uh, delivering what you have promised at different levels, internally, externally, that's what sets the team apart. But technically, I take my hat off to the team we have in Chile. Perfect. Now, the two last questions are about the country, right? The first one will be that Chile, in the last years, we have been a lot of political movement with attempts to change the constitution. And since the left are running the government, it seems that the foreign investment have seen Chile as a dangerous region uh, to invest. What you will say to those investors that are not quite sure of investing in Chile due to political issues? Well, I would quickly tell them to read a little more and understand Chile better. No, look, Amerigo has been a foreign investor in Chile for 20 years, and they have been years in which the country risk factor has never affected our operations or our productivity. The political life in Chile since the restitution of democracy in 1990 has been very orderly and respectful in every sense of the legal frameworks. In every sense of the legal frameworks. Every four years, there are presidential elections, there are no eventualities, power is transferred peacefully, and generally, yes, as I mentioned, there are no legal frameworks. And generally, yes, as you mentioned, it is transferred from a party more tenient to the left to one more tenient to the right. That balance is given. Now, as strengths, Chile is an eminently mining country, particularly talking about copper. So they understand what the copper industry is and they protect it. Chile has had a stable economic growth for decades and the macro policies they have in Chile are solid and have worked very well for them. Now, there are challenges. Of course, there are challenges in every country. Chile continues to work in areas that are important. The pension system, public health, public education. But this situation that has occurred and that you mentioned in the question of possible revisions to the constitution, what has happened? The business community and I would also say the common citizen have resisted to make very strong changes, to make structural changes. And this can be explained, I believe, because Chile is looking for continuity, stability and certainty. The example of these revisions to the constitution is the best example. A proposal to adopt a Nobel constitution, a completely new constitution, and it was rejected. And then they came back to the floor with a second proposal to amend the current constitution, and it was also rejected. These results should be read as a vote of confidence from a Chile that wants to be a stable country and does not want to have volatility and too abrupt changes, right? I would say that there can changes of tendency between one presidential term and the next in Chile, but the experience we have lived through indicates that the business environment and the participation of society in general, of civil society, are very important modulants to maintain an environment of stability and growth in Chile. And that is good for Chileans and it is good for foreign investors as well. 
And the last question that came out uh, during this interview is about Codelco. Codelco is a state-owned company, and I understand that have some kind of governments and uh, that might change depending on the political color that is running. Uh, but how this affects to the uh, relationship with Amerigo? Uh, do you find some stability? Do you think that the relations are more complicated depending who is running the government? It is an institutional relationship. It is a good, positive, constructive relationship. And Codelco's corporate governance is clearly established to be a corporate governance that looks after the interests of the company. So we have not seen strong changes uh, with changes of governments. Codelco is Codelco. It is the people of Chile. It is the salary of Chile. It is a great company to have a relationship with. Perfect, Aura. This was my last question. It has been an uh, awesome interview. I had enjoyed a lot this conversation about Ameringo. Um, I think that we have Czech project, the company, and how do you guys take care of the shareholders? That I think that it's one of the strengths of the company. I will ask you if you want the last minute to try to convince any shareholder that might hear or might discover with this talk Ameringo, and it's considering maybe to invest. Thank you, Amadeo. It has been a very interesting conversation. You raised it all very well, and we covered all the points that I think are important to communicate with respect to Amerigo. What differentiates us as a different copper producer, which in my opinion gives us strengths, minimizes risks or reduces risks, keeps us exposed to the copper price, which is fundamental and I think is a very important point of interest in the market today but also the fact that most of the mining companies always stay in that energy of growth. I want another project. Now I'm going to start exploring. Now I'm going to do a merger. I'm going to see who I buy. Everybody wants to consolidate and get bigger and bigger. Few companies, I would tell you that perhaps the... You could count on the finger of your hand. Are the companies that are focused on one operation we are uni-operational. We are in a very solid jurisdiction from our point of view. And I think it has been proven over time. Distinguishes us is this long-term relationship that we have to process these tailings to produce a green copper. Green copper, we talk about it. And the fact that we already have the experience of having executed our shareholder return strategy for the last three years, two and a half years, it has worked very well and it is practically ready to be leveraged with the copper prices we are seeing. So I think this is a very important moment of consolidation for Merigo, a moment that we have been looking for since 20 years ago when we acquired the company. This is where we wanted to be. And uh, we are now here and it is important for us to communicate where we are and what we are about. For us to communicate where we are and what we offer to an investor who wants this exposure to copper. Disclaimer. The content in Charlando de Minas is not an investment advice. Amadeo Bonet and his guests are not investment advisors. The authors may have interest in the companies mentioned in this publication. They may also have bias and not be impartial. The information in this publication and all the others in Charlando de Minas is impersonal by nature and should be considered as an entertainment product. The minimum risk of any investment mentioned in this video is 100% of the capital. Before to make any investment decision, contact to a financial or investment advisor or someone qualified with experience. This broadcast are a narrative of my learnings in the world of commodities and mining investment. In this podcast, we will try to bring experts, professionals and companies. If you like it, please subscribe. I am Amel Bonet. Welcome to Charlando de Minas.